everyone. I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to the Happiness Hour. Every week, photographers from all over the country meet here to connect, inspire, and create. Our guest speakers share images, photography tips, and their stories of inspiration. I've updated the schedule for upcoming presentations on my website at lindanickel.com. As well, there are links to previous sessions on YouTube. Tonight's guest is Jen Strongen. Jen is a nature photographer based in the Pacific Northwest. She, her work with the Seattle Aquarium Beach Naturalist Program allows her to explore local docks and the intertidal zone where land, sea, and humans cross paths. In tonight's presentation, at the intersection of art and science, photographing marine life from above the surface, Jen is going to share her stories and images and introduce us to a lot of sea creatures. If you're on Instagram, look for her at Jen S. Seattle and on her website at jenstrongenphotography.com. Welcome to the Happiness Hour, Jen. Thanks for having me here, Linda. I'm excited I'm, to be here. I really appreciate that, you know, you kind of took a chance and reply to an email. A lot of people will just go, I don't know what this lady is or what she wants, but I appreciate that you, you know, you kind of took me up on the invitation. Um, I glossed over your bio, so I know there's probably some holes that I want you to go ahead and fill in. Take this moment to, to share a little bit, little bit about yourself or anything that you want to, uh, that I completely missed. So with that, welcome. Thank you. I am glad to be here. Um, as I was telling you earlier, I am um, I'm not only a photographer, and that is work that I do, and I get paid a little bit from time to time for my photography, but my main job is that I help coordinate the Beach Naturalist Program for the Seattle Aquarium. And it's a community engagement outreach program where we are out at low tide during the spring and summer months. And we are talking to visitors on the beach about all of the amazing marine life that they see out there when the tide goes out. So um, my job really influences my photography and gives me a lot of opportunity to, to be outside. But I would also say that my photography really influenced me getting into that line of, of work as well. So um, I have a very non-traditional background. I do not have a science degree. Um, I have a degree in English literature. And at one point in my life, I thought I wanted to be a college professor, but um, my, my path uh, changed a couple of times <laughs> along the way. So, um, man, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that once I get into my uh, presentation. Perfect. Well, um, one of the things I'm going to say is that I'm just jealous because one of the things that I did in Washington when we were <clears throat> bumming around, you know, people kept saying, go to the tidal pools, you're going to find some really cool stuff. And I never found any. Thing. Oh my goodness. We didn't find anything. I was so disappointed. I think we found a crab like outside of the pool, but that's about it. So that's definitely a do-over um, that's on my list. So um I've well you'll have to you'll have to come back out and I personally will take you out to the tide pools and we'll go shoot together. It'll be really I fun. Would, I would love that. <laughs> I would love that. And um most people in this room that know me will tell you she'll show up. So don't, don't offer because I will come. Uh, I will. I've got a place for you to stay. So we'll talk later. Okay, perfect. <laughs> All right. Let's go ahead and get started with your presentation. Okay. There we go. All right. Everybody can see that okay? Yes, perfectly. Very good. Okay. So um, so these are this is these are some photos of me out in the field. That's where I'm going to start um, doing what I love doing best. 
which is uh, taking taking photographs and connecting people to the um, intertidal zone. And as I was saying earlier, um, you know, I, I don't have a very traditional pathway to this work. And I did start off, I have a degree in English literature, and then um, I switched gears and I ended up um, starting a coffee business here in Seattle. Uh, so uh, with my husband and uh, we ran our coffee business in our Capitol Hill neighborhood here in Seattle for uh, seven, eight years, eight years it was, um, but we sold it in 2007, um, right after I had a child. And I stayed home with my newborn for a little while. And during those years, I actually spent a lot of time on our local beaches. When you have a kid, going to the beach in Seattle with your kid is really fun. And I would go with uh, friends who knew a lot more about marine life than I did. And they really opened up my eyes to a world I didn't even know was there. So, um, and I found out that there was a beach naturalist program at the Seattle Aquarium and that you could volunteer and you didn't need to have a background in science in order to get involved. So that's what I did. And um, I felt like I had found my place. I loved it so much. And um, after about a year of uh, volunteering, they hired me on. So I've been on staff there uh, for seven, going on eight years now. And, um, but my photography, the photography piece for me started off taking pictures of things I was seeing on the beach and wanting to identify them and bringing those photos home with me, looking them up, learning more about what I was seeing. And it eventually sort of morphed into more of an artistic, um, uh, pro uh, an artistic endeavor for me. And now, uh, and I started to become more serious about my photography. So, um, so I began showing and selling my work and I continue to do that today and really like, like running the cafe for me, my job with the aquarium and also my photography really allow me to connect people in my community with something that I am really passionate about. And that is really important to me. So uh, this is, uh, I'm going to go over some of the gear that I use out in the fields. And you'll notice that there is a little point and shoot camera at the top of that gear list. And I just want to say, don't, uh, you know, don't be too hard on the point and shoots because they're a great tool. Uh, I use, I have an Olympus TG6 and it's got a flash diffuser on the front of it. And I kind of started off with this point and shoot camera and move to my other cameras, but then I still lean on this um, point and shoot for certain types of photography that I do. And it's a great, it's a great little camera. And I really do believe that the best camera is the one that you have with you. And um, this particular one is waterproof, so I can stick it in the water and it's really fantastic. Uh, I have an Olympus OMD EM1 Mark II. This is a uh, micro four thirds camera. It is weatherproof and really lightweight. And I have a 16 millimeter lens that is um, often my go-to lens when I'm out in the field with this camera. And I also uh, recently, um, over the past few years, moved to an, a Sony a7 III. And that's pretty much, that's the camera I use most of the time now. Um, I really like the full frame mirrorless camera. I like all the detail I can get with it. And I have a 90 millimeter macro lens that I um, really lean on with this uh, camera as well. And I have some other gear I use, some creative lenses um, and some other things that help me when I'm out in the field. So I was telling Linda earlier, I am a, a lens baby ambassador. I use their lenses quite a bit quite a bit more probably for the forest uh, photography that I do, but um, but I also use them sometimes out in the intertidal zone. Um, I have a loom cube, which is a tool that I don't leave home without when I go to do this type of photography. It's a little um, LED light, it's waterproof, it's rechargeable, it's amazing. And I bring a small tripod with me that I can put it on the tripod if I need to set it up for extra light. I can stick it in a tide pool if I need extra light. It's really helpful. 
Um, I have a high lumen uh, flashlight that I bring with me, great for uh, taking pictures of things that are in rocks and crevices, and really great for night photography, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. And um, I have this little moment macro uh, lens on here that goes on my phone, and sometimes I just use that for helping me to see things that are really small and I want to take a closer look at. I would be remiss if I did not mention uh, some other things I bring with me, like microfiber cloths. Um, those are important for me for wiping off my equipment and my hands when I am out in the field. Uh, this type of photography, you're exposed to the elements, which aren't always the best thing for your camera, so I do my best to protect the equipment that I have. So we're going to start off in the um, intertidal zone where I do most of my marine life photography. And um, this is that very special place where the land meets the sea. So when the tides go out, there is a whole underwater world that is revealed um, that us humans get to visit without being divers or snorkelers, which I am not either one of those things. Um, so all of my photography, type of photography is on the above the surface, although I'm hoping Melissa, who is on here, might take me uh, to do some snorkeling with her someday if, uh, if I get brave enough. We'll see. <laughs> but in the Pacific Northwest, um, we have extreme low tides here during daylight hours during the spring and summer. Uh, between the months of May and August, and then those extreme tides switch over to nighttime during the winter months of November through February. So we have some months where we don't really have very extreme tides that are good for going out and exploring tide pools, but um, we, have a, we have windows of time in the spring and summer and then in the winter. So having a tide chart is really important for the photography I do. Tide charts are really easy to access online these days. Um, US Harbors is a site I use pretty regularly, but I also have an app for my phone um, called uh, Tides Near Me that will give me the information about what the tides are wherever I am. And you can see highlighted there, This is these are the tides for this month in Seattle. And um, you'll see a minus sign next to those tides I highlighted, a minus two, minus um, three. So those are the, that means that they are below, they're minus three feet below the average low tide line. So a lot more is going to be exposed and visible at low tide. And you can also see that um, these happen at night at 11 p.m. and 12.30 a.m. in the winter. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about going out and photographing things at night, but you know, you have to you have to be prepared for braving the elements and dressing warmly when you go out there at night for sure. So my goal as a photographer is to bring to the surface both, you know, literally and metaphorically that sense of joy and wonder that the intertidal environment inspires in me. Both my work with the aquarium and my work as a photographer, um, I, if I can inspire someone to love these unique and beautiful animals, that connection um, might in turn inspire them to want to protect this marine environment um, that these animals live in. I lean uh, heavily on my macro lenses to make visible some of the animals that might go unnoticed. Everyone's pretty familiar with our charismatic megafauna here in the Pacific Northwest. Like Linda and I were talking about earlier, whales, we have lots of whales here. We have seals and sea lions, but, um, but I really like to put a spotlight on the charismatic microfauna too. So for me, macro lenses are like a portal to another dimension, and they really help me to see the world in an entirely new way. And I really like um, bringing that sense of, of wonder and excitement to people with my photography. So um, I love encouraging people to look closer to things too when they're outside, to take that time to slow down and um, really notice all of the things around you in your environment. And sometimes I go out with a specific purpose, looking for certain animals, and other times I'm just out there to see what I can observe. And I feel like the more you look and learn that the more the natural world opens up to you. So this, is, this animal is uh, a stocked jelly. 
It's um, this image was taken on San Juan Island. And um, these are very small invertebrates. They're only about a half an inch to maybe an inch tall. And unlike uh, many other jellyfish, they, um, they, you wouldn't find them uh, swimming around because they have a sticky stalk that they use to attach themselves to a substrate like seaweed or eelgrass or a rock, as in this case. And they have these pom-poms of tentacles with stinging cells that they use to capture small crustaceans from the water that they like to eat. And um, if they do get detached, they can easily move themselves to another surface. And, you know, one of the biggest challenges of taking photos above the surface of the water, especially with tiny animals like this, is glare from the water. Um, motion from the water is another, um, is another big challenge. So um, to combat glare, I, um, I do have polarizing filters, but I rarely use them, quite honestly. I'm more apt to just move myself around and uh, create shadow uh, with my body to eliminate the glare from the water. And that usually works pretty well. Um, I also have a hood, hoods on both of my macro lenses, my, my 60 and my 90 millimeter. And I find that having the hood on also helps to eliminate that glare from the water. So, um, and this, uh, this animal was in a tide pool, um, a true tide pool where the water is in a, it's a pool of water that is away from the main body of water. So there aren't currents affecting it. And it's a still body of water, which makes it a lot easier to photograph animals, especially when they are this tiny. You'll notice there's a lot of uh, particulate in the water in this image. And um, I had dunked my loom cube, that little square light that I have underneath the water to give this um, animal a little bit more light. And it really highlighted all the plankton that was floating around in the water. Our, our Pacific Northwest waters are very nutrient rich in the summer with a lot of plankton. And sometimes I like to edit those out of my photographs, but at other times I really like to leave them in because it just looks like a galaxy to me. And I sort of feel that way when I'm looking into the into these tiny worlds. I'm, it's like I'm looking into another galaxy. So sometimes I like to have all that plankton in there. Exploring slowly really reveals a lot of things. Um, taking your time, stopping, staring in one tide pool for a while, um, you'll start to notice a lot of things moving around that you probably wouldn't if you were just walking quickly by. So, um, and this, uh, this is another type of jellyfish that we have here in the Pacific Northwest. This is called a hanging belly jelly. And um, because the belly hangs down from below the bell of the jellyfish, they're also very small. And, um, you know, I feel like photography is kind of like time traveling for me. It's just, this photo takes me really back to this moment. This is also on, on San Juan Island and I had never seen one of these before. And I often talk to myself when I'm out in the field <laughs> alone. I mean, when I have people with me, I will be talking to them and expressing my enthusiasm, but I was by myself at, at this time. And I just remember saying out loud, what is that? Oh my gosh, and just trying to get pictures of it. So um, that what is that and those aha exciting moments are um, are really joyful for me. And I like to I definitely like sharing that with other people when I'm out with them, or maybe just they can experience that through my work. Uh, this is uh, when you're after seeing that hanging belly jelly, I, I've seen them a lot since then. So when you see something for the first time, you start to notice it more and more and your eyes get tuned into that particular animal, especially these small animals. So um, this, uh, I, this was on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington state. And this was looking into a tide pool that was kind of dark and underneath the overhang of a rock. And the white part of this animal's foot really um, caught my eye. And I knew it was a nudibranch because I have just seen them so many times out in the wild. And I sort of am tuned into looking for their, their movement or a bright spot that might indicate that they're there. Um, this one is, a nudibranch is a sea slug, if you're not familiar. And I don't think either of those names really are they don't really convey the be the true beauty of these animals. They come in many shapes and forms and sizes. A lot of them are, are pretty tiny. 
Um, but this one looked so striking in this tide pool. Um, it was using the, uh, the surface of the water. These animals use surface tension to move upside down along the surface of the water. And it was just cruising right by this big uh, green anemone. And you'll, I put the ISO up here because uh, I do tend to use higher ISOs um, out in the field in these darker areas. And um, I do it a lot to keep my shutter speed up. I am not a tripod shooter. I don't like tripods. They feel cumbersome to me. They get in my way. So um, having not having one feels more organic and natural to me. Um, but it means that it's harder to do macro photography without that steadying um, help of the tripod. So I lean on higher ISOs and higher shutter speeds. And although one over 60 is not super high shutter speed, um, I did, uh, this is my Olympus camera, which is very small and lightweight. And this camera, I feel like I can get away with a slightly lower shutter speeds because it doesn't reflect the movement of my hands all that much. It's easier to hold it tight and steady because it's small. Um, but I, this is sort of ideal with, with the 60 millimeter lens to have it be at least one over, one over 60. And this is the same animal, just so you can see it from the top. They have uh, these beautiful serrata. These are these, uh, the branches that come up off the top of the body. And um, they're just a really, stunning animal to see when you're out at low tide. So I, I do take pictures, a lot of pictures of things that are in, in the water, shooting through the water, but there's a lot on the beach that's exposed. It's not in the water that I find interesting, that I enjoy photographing. And also some, some are things that give me clues that a particular animal might be around that I wanna see. So um, nudibranchs are one of my favorite animals and looking for their, their eggs are always a good clue to find them or you know, look for, know they're around. So this is an egg mass from a different type of nudibranch called, uh, commonly called a sea lemon. And um, this, this mass of eggs really looked like a knitted scarf to me. It was one of the most beautiful egg masses I've, I've ever seen. So I knew, I knew there was one around. I did look around, I did find one, which was exciting, but I have to say like the photographs of the egg mass turned out to be something more interesting to, to me. So there are millions of eggs in this egg mass. And I do a lot of uh, taking, I take a lot of pictures from different, uh, different angles or closer in or farther away. And, you know, sometimes that's, sometimes that's the best, but sometimes something else comes out of it that gives me an, a different point of view that I really love. So I always encourage people to change their point of view when they're taking pictures. Um, so, you know, hazards of uh, photography in the intertidal zone are sand, water, and salt, they're all enemies of your, your camera. So um, it makes it challenging sometimes. And I'm mentioning that because uh, this, this picture was not taken with my 90 millimeter lens. This was taken with my Sigma R35 millimeter lens because my 90 millimeter lens was in the shop at the time for the second time uh, to remove sand from it. <laughs> so I really try my best to keep my hands clean and keep uh, sand off of and salt off of my lens, but it's, it's hard to do. I have to say my Sony camera is a lot more delicate uh, than my Olympus. My Olympus is, um, it's pretty tough and durable and amazing. I've never had an issue with it. I can put it through the paces and it's, uh, can, it can endure the elements a lot better than my Sony camera. So anyway, I did have my uh, I did have my Olympus camera on this trip as well, but I decided to put my Sigma 35 on just to see, um, you know, just to take pictures with, with that through that lens. And it was really fun. I really enjoyed it. It gave me a different perspective on the tide pools. And this uh, photograph was shot at f 1.4, so pretty shallow depth of field, but it still captured a lot of, of detail from, uh, from this scene. And so again, taken with the same lens. Um, the, these are photographs looking down into a couple of different tide pools. 
And, um, you know, I love getting to observe animal behavior and things that, you know, there's always something unique and different to see when you're out there. So this was this past summer, and the Olympic Peninsula tide had gone out and these anemones were in the middle of spawning when that happened. So, um, so these are male anemones, they have separate sexes and that white milky stuff is their sperm. So it had no currents to carry um, the, the sperm along at that moment because they were in a tide pool. So the sperm had just pooled up um, inside these anemones that were in the process of releasing it. You can see the one on the right where it had flowed out and ended up into that empty mussel shell, which was very interesting to me. <laughs> Um, so, like I said, I love the little things. Um, I really like to put a spotlight on them, but um, I also have a really huge spot in my heart for octopuses. They're one of my favorite animals to see out in the wild at low tide. I spent years and years and years going to the same spot on the Olympic Peninsula trying to see a giant Pacific octopus with no luck, but finally... Um, a couple of years ago, I saw my first one and I've had a lot of luck seeing a, a whole bunch of them for, over the past couple of years, including with Melissa, who's on this presentation. She and I got to sit over a giant Pacific octopus in a tide pool with our, our cameras this summer, and it was, it was pretty magical. So um, we have uh, several species of octopus here in the Pacific Northwest. And this one is a giant Pacific octopus, which are not common for me to see here in Seattle tide pools, but a little bit more likely to come across if you're out on the outer coast. Um, these are beautiful animals. They can change their skin texture, their skin color, and um, they're very smart and amazing. So I love photographing them. This particular image I converted to black and white because I really wanted to show off all the textures of this animal. And this is another one from the summer and uh, in color. And they have these uh, chromatophores, which are color changing, like packs socks of pigment under their skin. So you can see that this uh, octopus has them on uh, the eyes, on the lids of the eye as well. And this one really looked like, uh, the eye really looked like a galaxy to me. And this was taken with my Olympus uh, 60 millimeter macro lens. I was sitting um, uh, at the edge of a tide pool looking down um, at this animal. And this is that same, this is that same animal. Um, really magnificent. It was just hanging out, breathing, um, and uh, really had a lot of color change and texture change to its skin. And a fun thing to me about going home and looking at this photograph was that I noticed in the bottom left-hand corner, although it isn't in focus, there's a, a fish called a gunnel that we have here in the Northwest, which looks a lot like a, an eel, um, but it's not an eel, it's a fish. And um, I hadn't noticed it at all. I was so focused on that amazing octopus um, that it made me laugh that there was a fish sitting there for quite a while that I just had no idea until I looked at my picture when I got back. Um, barnacles, so barnacles, not as sexy as an octopus for sure, but they're one of my favorite animals to talk about when I'm on the beach with people. Uh, folks tend to walk right by them or ignore them or be annoyed by them because they're sharp and they're, uh, you know, they cut, cut you when you're out in the uh, walking around the beach, but um, I think they're amazing and beautiful animals. I love photographing them. Um, we have a variety of species here in the Pacific Northwest, and this one is a gooseneck barnacle from the um, from the outer coast. And you can see that it's um, it has some other animals living on it. It has some smaller uh, another species of barnacle on the very tip. It's got a limpet on there. There's a little muscle tucked in the back that's not in focus. So these uh, these animals form clusters and they provide a lot of surface area for other animals to settle and for a lot of nooks and crannies for animals to hide out in as well. They have beautiful textures. Um, I, look, I look for textures a lot when I'm out photographing at low tide and that's a great thing that uh, 
you know, to use a macro lens for is really showing off those textures and details and, um, you know, barnacles, just in case you don't know, they are crustaceans, they're related to shrimp and crabs. And they, uh, they start off their life in a larval form and then they find a good spot to be and they glue their head to a rock and build their house and they spend the rest of their lives upside down feeding with their feet. Uh, so they're pretty, they're pretty cool. I really love showing people the diversity of animals in our inner tidal zone, again, whether it's in person or with my photography. Um, and quite honestly, I really wish people would move through the world with the same curiosity and openness and acceptance of diversity with each uh, with other humans as they do with the natural world. But my mind is blown on a regular basis when I'm out there. Um, you know, this looks like a plant, but this this whole thing is an animal. Um, this is a feather plumed hydroid and it's related to jellies and anemones, animals with stinging cells that use, uh, they use those cells to capture their prey. And this large cluster of this hydroid was attached to the stipe or a stem of bull kelp, which is a really large uh, seaweed that we have here in the Pacific Northwest. And it was up high in the intertidal zone. So you really, wouldn't have to be there for a super low tide to see some of these things that end up in what's called the wreck line or the drift line where the high tide gets to its highest point and then recedes and leaves things behind. So um, that's another area of the beach that I really like exploring and documenting what I find. Um, it's always that wreck line is always full of surprises. This is one of those, what is that moments when I saw it? This was on the Oregon coast. Um, I've only seen this animal once there. Um, it is an ocean going barnacle called a blue buoy barnacle. And you can see that it has what looks like a piece of styrofoam attached to it, but it's actually a float that the animal secretes to keep themselves buoyant in the water uh, when they're out in the ocean. And um, so they're just suspended in the water, capturing food with their feet. And they're blue, which is really cool. Um, so the, that rack line or drift line is a great place to also look for seaweeds. Um, the seaweeds are not plants, they're an algae. And I feel like <clears throat> they're often overlooked by folks as an annoyance. They're smelly, they're slimy, um, you know, they cover the beach at low tide, it makes it hard to get around, but they are, I'm always inspired by their resilience and their beauty. We have over 600 species of seaweeds here in the Pacific Northwest, and they have a huge diversity in their shapes and forms. Um, seaweeds are the foundation of our marine ecosystem here, providing food and habitat for so many species of marine animals, including the beloved Pacific Northwest salmon. And they have many uses for humans as well. You'll find them in your toothpaste, ice cream, skincare products, and they are of course something that we like to eat. So my goal again with my photography is really to bridge that, that gap to open people's eyes to what's around them and to see things in a new way and emphasizing textures and diversity of seaweed is um, a great way for me to bring people in and um, I, you, we have three, there's really just three color types of seaweeds. There's browns, greens, and reds, and they're all represented here on the screen. And you can see that these all are, looks so different. They take on really different forms. Um, and the middle photograph also has a green sponge in the middle there, which is not the seaweed. So just, just so you know, but um, I love, seaweeds are one of my favorite photography subjects out at Live Time. This is a, a seaweed called dead man's fingers or staghorn seaweed. Sometimes it's called felty fingers, has great common names. It's just this beautiful seaweed that uh, we don't have it here on our local beaches in Seattle, but you find it on the outer coast. And I may, I go out there every year just to take pictures of this particular seaweed. This is just an image to show you what a big cluster of it looks like out of the water at low tide. So there are three colors of seaweed, but 
Uh, some seaweeds have a cuticle uh, on the uh, on their blades, which um, gives them an iridescent sheen. So this is um, a seaweed that has that, and it really um, some of our iridescent seaweeds here are just incredible. They look like um, they look like nothing you've ever seen. Again, like looking into looking into a galaxy, looking up to the sky. They're just beautiful. They're a little tricky. It's I find it tricky to get a photograph of them that appropriately captures that sheen. It's really hard, especially with glare in the sun. And again, like just moving around and trying to capture the right, capture it at the right angle is um, is what I do to get a good picture of it. This is another example of that iridescent seaweed. And this one is downtown Seattle. So this is right on the edge of our urban environment. Um, there was a really big restoration project at this particular beach uh, and to restore it back to its natural habitat. And it's a really wonderful place for, um, for seaweeds and uh, photography at low tide. Seaweeds come in, in many forms. I mentioned before, this one is uh, a coralline algae. So it really looks like, it really does look like a coral. It gets its hard structure from calcium carbonate. And since calcification, the process that makes these plants hard takes a lot of energy. Um, they're a really slow growing uh, seaweed and they, an eight inch um, articulated coralline algae might be more than nine years old. So they, they're, a, long living, long growing seaweed. So I sometimes like to use glare and reflections to my advantage and it helps me to tell a story, especially one of interconnectedness and um, you know that this is myself reflected in this bulb of bull kelp, downtown Seattle um, puts me right into the scene that I'm taking a, a picture of. So I like sometimes to show those human, human connections in my images wanted to share a couple of more photos from some you know strange and beautiful animals from low tide. This is a Lewis's moon snail, which is the largest of our marine snails. Um, as uh, their shell can be the size of a grapefruit and their foot can be about a foot long. And um, I use some creative editing in this photograph to give it more of a, a painterly effect, which um, I do not do with all of my photographs, but sometimes um, an image really speaks to me as something that I want to give a little bit more uh, editing and effect to. And this was one of them. So this animal was in the water though. So it was underneath the surface of the water. And this is a comb jelly. Um, it looks like an alien spaceship in the water when it's moving around. They have these transparent bodies and these uh, tiny hairs that go all around their, their body that ref refract light. So, um, you know, if, if you're not, if they're not in the right light, they can be hard to see, but once the light hits them, they look like these rotating rainbow light shows. Uh, so this is a, a place where my extra lights come in handy. I, I will use them to shine onto these animals to capture that rainbow glow that they create. Nighttime photography at low tide, it happens during the winter here and it's a lot of fun. It's super challenging because it's dark <laughs> and you're just using your flashlight or headlamp um, to help light up what you're taking pictures of. And uh, you can see in the middle, I have a flashlight on my lap and my friend Marcus, who was with me, had his loom cube on a monopod and we were lighting up this amazing uh, sunflower star that unfortunately is now one that we don't see hardly ever now because they got um, wiped out this uh, over the past few years by a, a sea star wasting disease. So they're on the critically endangered species list now, but we used to see them a lot more often, especially at night. Um, they're really, really amazing animals. But anyway, taking pictures at night, high ISOs are definitely my friend and higher shutter speeds too. 
So this is a, a species that is in our water all year round, but they are, seem to be definitely more prevalent during the um, winter months at low tide. It's called a white-lined dirona or an alabaster dirona, which is a kind, another kind of nudibranch. And they really make for a dramatic subject, especially under a light um, with the darkness surrounding them in a tide pool. And I um, often convert my Dirona pictures to black and white because they are such dramatic subjects and that black and white to me really gives them a more artistic feel and brings out just that, the, the beauty and drama of that particular species. Uh, these are some moon glow anemones that, um, moon glow anemones are always around, but they look especially beautiful at night under a flashlight. I think that's where they, really shine, not to pun, I guess that pun intended, they, but it's really, um, they look especially beautiful at night and they're a lot of fun to photograph and they just have a lot of different colors. Whoops, sorry folks. Um, a black light is something that I like to bring out to low tide at night too, because we have a lot of animals that, um, that bio uh, fluoresce, which is really fun. So on the left is an opalescent squid, which is an animal that we won't see at our low tides here during the summer, but um, we are more likely to see in the winter time because they will come into shallow waters to mate. So um, our, it's one, one reason to bundle up and go out into the cold dark winter nights to see these beautiful squid and on the right is an aggregating anemone a very very common anemone in our inner tidal zone but um, when you see them at night with the black light on them biofluorescing it's, it's super magical uh, i do some adjusting to my white balance when I, i'm taking pictures that are with the black light so just to compensate and make sure that the color color is right for what i'm seeing out there and this is just another, another view of an opalescent squid. They're often moving, so they're a little harder to capture. It makes it um, a little bit more challenging. And I sort of liked this image because I felt like I was able to capture some detail of the squid, but then also the motion of the, the fins as it was swimming. So, Jen, let me ask you a question before you move off the squid. Yeah. Um, Susan is wanting to know, are these squid actually underwater? Is that what she's looking at? Yes. Yep. Yeah. yeah. These are underwater. Okay. So underwater and I'm looking down on them. Okay. Yep. And then these are the arms of one of the opalescent squid at night. Uh, they have eight arms and two tentacles. Uh, so the tentacles are just for capturing prey. The arms have a variety of uses, but they have these really tiny suction cups. And again, you know, I converted this one into black and white because I felt like it really enhanced the, the detail and the mood of the, the image. Um, we also see octopuses at night at low tide in Seattle, not giant Pacific octopuses generally, but these are another species we have here called a Pacific red octopus. They're pretty small. They usually are about one to two pounds. Um, and I really, I especially liked that image on the, the right. Um, this octopus was obviously out, these, these are out of the water. So sometimes they will get stranded out of the water at low tide, usually if they're in a, um, if they have enough water around them to keep themselves oxygenated, they'll be okay. But I've been, uh, I have definitely participated in some octopus rescues in my time out on the beach. Um, then I would just, I have to say, if you, if that ever happened, you wouldn't want to ever want to pick up an octopus with your hands. Uh, they're venomous animals. They have a beak. Um, they will be angry at you. So, you know, handle, handling them, uh, scooping them up with something else, like a, a blade of seaweed or a container or a shell or something to help them get to water is the thing to do, not to pick them up with your hands. Anyway, um, generally try not to touch them at all when I'm out there. But I, I like this one on the, on the right because the reflection of the water really created a, a unique and um, dramatic image. And uh, this is an animal that took a lot of patience and time to photograph. I took 
so many pictures and I only got a couple that I really felt were good. I don't know if any of you have experienced that out in the field, especially with wildlife that's moving where, you know, sometimes it takes a lot of a lot of shooting to get one or two images that you really like. So um, this is a, a another type of a nudibranch. Um, this one is a, a winged sea slug and um, they are really tiny, tiny animals, beautiful animals that look like they are dancing or when they're moving in the water, they have a way of folding up those pieces of their body that look like wings and twirling around in a circle and then opening them back up again. They're amazing animals. Um, so they are there. I think they're around all year long, but they come into shallower waters to, to mate in the winter time. So it's a better time to get a look at them if you're out in tide pools around my area. And this was, this image was taken in Seattle. And of course there's seaweeds. So I have to just circle back to them because seaweeds at night under your flashlight um, are beautiful. And this was on the San Juan Islands. Um, you know, most of the seaweeds die back during the winter time, but the reds tend to stick around. So, uh, so there's always something, there's always something to see out there. So I'm going to, um, am I doing okay for, I'm doing okay for time. Yeah. Yeah, you're doing great. Okay, good. So um, don't, don't stop. This is Linda's selfish hour tonight. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving these photos. Oh, good. So, uh, so another Another place that I take photographs besides of marine life, besides the intertidal zone, are, are in marinas on the docks. And, um, you know, in, engaging, I have to say, engaging with community really helps open your eyes to new ways of seeing. And um, it's one of the reasons I know there's a lot of there's a lot of negative things about social media, for sure. Um, but I fa have found that Instagram has been an amazing platform for me to connect with a lot of wonderful creative people, Linda, you know, or your, yourself included, Melissa, who's on here. Um, I just, I feel like it's, uh, you know, that sense of community is really important and, and having people that show you new things or you can learn from each other and inspire each other is really wonderful. So I have, uh, someone I met through Instagram, her name is Luann Roberts, and I now know her in person and have spent quite a bit of time with her out in, uh, out in the wild, but she introduced me to this deeper way of looking at animals off docks. I'd always um, enjoyed appearing off the dock when I was at the marina waiting for a ferry, um, but I didn't really do it in quite the same deep way that, that she did. So, so marinas are these, you know, they're man-made structures. They provide a lot of surface area for um, dock fouling organisms, which are animals that settle on the docks. And um, it creates pretty interesting habitat to look for animals. And an advantage of viewing marine life on the docks this way is that it's not dependent on the tides, not dependent on the time of year or the time of day. Um, you can really go anytime uh, that's convenient to you, which is excellent. It makes it um, a lot easier. So, um, you know, the most of most of my photography off the docks is done with my point and shoot with my Olympus TG6. Um, I do shoot with my other cameras as well, um, but a lot I do a lot of my documentation with my um, point and shoot camera, including this image up on the screen that was taken with my Olympus TG6. Um, really, it's a great, it's a great little camera. It does, it, it does the trick. So, so when you're looking off the docks, there are these like little mini landscapes um, of, of these dock fouling organisms. And this one is a feather duster worm, which is the orange uh, floof in the middle there. And it's surrounded by these plumose anemones, which, uh, you know, at some locations, there are just tons and tons of these anemones off the dock. So it just looked like this weird Dr. Seuss landscape to me. And um, I loved it. But there's lots of, there's always lots of little mini underwater landscapes off of the docks. 
Um, this one is another another nudibranch. Sorry to bring up so many nudibranchs. They're just one of my <laughs> they're just one of my favorite subjects. Um, this one is called a golden derona, and this is up on San Juan Island off the docks, where I see them with regularity more during the um, winter months there. Um, I've seen them year round, but again, they seem to be one of those animals that's around more during the during the winter time months. And I have to say, so this was taken with my Sony camera from above the surface and taking photos with that camera on the dock always feels a little dicey to me at times. I'm always like double and triple checking that my camera is secured. My strap is around my neck. Um, it's my biggest fear that like I'm going to trip and my camera is going to fly off me and end up on, you know, in the water at the marina. So I get a little paranoid about that. Um, anyway, but uh, these are these are one of my these are one of my favorites to see on the docks when I am on San Juan Island. And having an assistant is really great. So, um, and I should have backtracked it and said that about you know taking photographs at I mean really in any any situation that I'm out there having but mostly nighttime and dock dockside photography. I really appreciate having someone with me who can help me hold a light. Or in this case, I coerced my husband to come with me and he actually held this um, blade of seaweed. So I steady so I could get a picture of this particular nudibranch. This is a hooded nudibranch. It was very tiny and it was on this huge blade of kelp just cruising along looking really beautiful. Um, but after my husband, this is the first time this when I took this picture, but the first time my husband had come out and um, explored the docks with me. And he um, told me he would come do it with me anytime because he thought it was really fun. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was glad um, because it is fun. Anyway, he was a good assistant and, um, you know, and he was great at holding this, this blade still for me. Um, and, you know, we had to move around. I had to move around a little bit. Again, moving around just to keep keep it in a, keep things in a position where I wasn't catching any glare or reflection off of the water. Uh, this is, um, this one was taken under the water. So I actually stuck my camera under the water for this one. This is taken with uh, the TG6 with my little point and shoot camera. Um, mostly I'm an invertebrate obsessed photographer. Um, I think they're really cool and people don't uh, notice them enough. So I want to bring them to people's attention, but fish are pretty cool too. And I've been um, appreciating them more and more. So uh, this one is one of my favorite species we have here in the Pacific Northwest. This is a sailfin sculpin. And um, I saw a couple of them off of the docks this summer. And they have a huge, not, it's not in this picture, but they have a, a huge um, dorsal fin that looks like a, a sail. And they're very graceful swimmers. And um, they have chromatophores um, over their eyes, those chromatophores, those pigment, um, pigment sacs, just like uh, octopuses have. And uh, I was really pleased with uh, the fact that my TG6 was able to capture that in so much detail. Um, so these are just, uh, really beautiful fish. I will often put my focus on eyes or in, you know, if it's a nudibranch on rhinophores, some deep, some detail that really draws your eye in. So I think about this quote a lot when I'm out taking pictures. This is from John Steinbeck from the Log of the Sea of Cortez. All things are, are one thing, and that one thing is all things. Plankton, a shimmering phosphorescence on the sea, and the spinning planets, and an expanding universe all bound together by the elastic string of time. It is advisable to look from the tide pool to the stars, and then back to the tide pool again. I just think a lot about the connection of all things when I'm out photographing marine life. There's so many opportunities in the wild to view communities and connections. And, you know, this, this oyster shell in this picture was a great example of that where, you know, here's this abandoned shell, but now it's got a little baby sea star living on it. And it has bryzoan, which are another kind of invertebrate. And it's got some boring sponge and some bits of 
hydroid and some bissel threads left over from a mussel. So it's got all these things living in community together on the top of this shell while coexisting. So um, anyway, I think I think about that a lot with, with my photography and really try and ex express that to folks when we're out together. So I have some tips for this type of photography. The number one is just to be a considerate beach or dock guest to do your best to observe and photograph animals where they're at in the wild. I'm a big advocate of leaving things where they are, observing them where they are. Um, I use iNaturalist a lot for learning and for looking at what has been popping up around my area. So um, if I know I'm going to San Juan Island next week, I might look and see what people have been observing there and where, and I might that might give me some good clues about what I want to go and photograph while I'm while I'm visiting. I'm moving around. I know I've said it many times, but it really is true. Moving around, trying different angles, using your body to create shadow um, and eliminate glare from the water. Polarizing lenses can also help, but not not totally necessary. Um, I like to look for contrast and textures and colors when I'm out at low tide. Um, high shutter speed, it's totally my friend. I lean on it. It's a key for me for steady handheld macro shots. I like to take things real slow. Um, I find that when you are taking it slow, you can see a lot more, which is helpful. And get to know your local spots really well. I mean, it's great to travel the it's great to travel the world and and see things and photograph things, but it's also I'm a big advocate for knowing what's in your backyard really well. So whether that's marine life or whether it's the forest or whether it's street photography, what, whatever whatever you do, I think getting to getting to know your local area is really a really wonderful gift. And I know you mentioned this already, but you can find me on my, on my website, on Instagram, it's Jenna Seattle, and I have a Facebook page as well. Oh, so thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. We have questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm kind, yeah. of, I'm kind of disappointed that all, I mean, you're done showing photos because I think I'm a pretty good observer of small things, but my goodness, I use photograph things and pointed out things, especially one of the last photos where that teeny, I'm like, where is the starfish? And there was a teeny, it's like, it was like just, I don't know, it was like a Christmas decoration. It was so tiny, like a sequin. It was really, really cool. And the, uh, okay, so let me just hit you with some questions. Okay. Okay. Um, let's start with, okay, so I think your, your soul sister is in this room too. Susan Hansen is a local. She's here. Um, just south of Austin and she has the San Marcos River in her backyard and she spends a lot of time snorkeling through and, and she takes a lot of underwater oh, images with her Olympus T6 so she you guys have the same nice <laughs> yeah and she just this whole thing with a lot of questions so it's going to be Susan's selfish hour too <laughs> okay to know, how close are you to your subject and and how do you really position yourself above the tide pool so, uh, you know, that really, it really depends on the subject. So, I mean, and, and it depends on my camera too. So not, you know, TG6 aside, if I'm using my, my Sony 90 millimeter macro lens, I'm going to have, I'm going to be a little farther away than I would be with my, um, Olympus 60 millimeter lens that, that particular camera, I have to be fairly close to capture what I want to capture, but um, the 90 millimeter gives me a little bit more space. Um, uh, yeah. And so, so, oh, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's okay. Go, that, that's okay. Go ahead. Because uh, we're talking the T, is it the TG6? Mm -hmm. You know, are you using the macro settings on it? I use a variety. Uh, yeah. I use a variety of settings on there. Yes. Macro settings, but um Sometimes I will use the uh, now now aperture. There's an aperture priority mode on that 
camera and you can set that aperture priority mode to have a super macro view. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and that, um, that help you have a little control over your shutter speed with that if you are using that flash diffuser, or if you use your flash. So, and that helps me to get some crisper, more, more crisp shots with that camera. But I also will do the microscope. There's like a little microscope mode. And there's also an underwater mode that has a macro option. So I use all three of those depending on the situation. Okay. Um, Kathy's question is, do you need to be very careful not to destroy some of those delicate seaweeds and animals as you're walking around the tide pools? Do you have any, um, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> what are you, what, I mean, but it's a good question. You know, what can, you know, we get it. I would be really excited. And what can I do to avoid harming, causing harm? What's, do you have any tips? Another good reason to walk slowly when you're out there. So you do really want to be mindful about where you're putting your feet. Yeah. And, and, um, and walk, you know, making sure you're not stepping on animals while you're, while you're out there. So there's another really good reason to go slow. Um, in Seattle, we also have, you know, I say tide pooling, but a lot of the beach photos, uh, taken in Seattle, we don't have those traditional pools of water in rocky areas. So you're going to be walking through water sometimes and just, you know, avoiding walking through areas of, of eelgrass where a lot of animals hide out is a good thing to do. And like I said, just be mindful of where your feet are. And at night, it's, it's uh, especially trickier because it's dark. So making sure you have a good light to light your way is important. Um, let's go to light. Um, Darlene says, you, you, this is where you're talking about your black light. Mm. Those were probably some of my favorite photos because of the, co the colors were just so vivid. So um, I'm like, I would come there just for the <laughs> black <laughs> areas. Um, but Darlene's curious, um, is your dark is your black light battery operated or battery powered? And she's only she's only seen the electric ones. And then can you suggest where she could find one? Yeah, so my I have I have a couple of different black lights and one is battery. Well, they're both battery, but I think one is a rechargeable one. And you can I mean you can find them, you can find them on Amazon. Um you know, of, of a variety of price ranges. So I have, I have one that's pretty inexpensive and I bought a slightly more expensive one um, recently, but um, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a top of the line black light or anything. It can be a simple one. Okay. It'll still work great. Um, I liked, okay. So I grew up in South Texas. There's not a lot of water around. <laughs> I'm not a swimmer. I, and, you know, I, I love aquariums, but I don't get in the water. So the octopus photos were extremely interesting to me. Rose wants to know, do the octopus react to humans when you get close to them? Um, they seem to be, you know, pretty smart. You know, she's wondering if what kind of awareness, you know, are they going to jump out at me if I see, you know, <laughs> I don't know. So how do, how, how do they react to you? How close can you get to them? So I've had, I mean, I've had a number of octopus encounters and they're all different, but they're definitely not going to, they're not going to be a fast reacting, latch onto your arm and try and pull you towards them. Um, <laughs> you know, they're, they, most of the, most of the encounters I've had with them, you know, they're just trying to, they're just trying to keep on keeping on. They're trying to survive that low tide until the tide comes back in. Um, they don't, um, if anything, they're going to retract away from you rather than move towards you, right? Because they're they're going to want to keep themselves protected. So, um, but I've had a, I've had a couple of experiences where on the on the Olympic Peninsula where they have come out of the tide pool. We had one that we saw and it was hunkered down. It was in a perfect spot, you know, covered in water. 
keeping itself oxygenated, but for some reason it decided to go on a little tour. And there were just, you know, there a group of probably like 10 people sitting around the side pool and it just came out of the water and it walked all the way around there. And it was, you could hear a pin drop. Everybody got really quiet and just watched it. It didn't do any, like it didn't move towards any person, but it just came out and explored its environment to see what was going on. And then it went right back to where it was. So. <laughs> you know, it never even occurred to me that they would, um, out of the water, much less, you know, I always think of octopus as deep, deep, deep ocean, you know, it's on TV, it's not something right. I, would, I would ever experience, so that's exciting, just the thought of that. Um, Donna's question is, what depths of water are you generally photographing through? Oh, not very, not very deep, you know, maybe a couple feet at, at max. <clears throat> Um, Susan is wondering on these, um, are the organisms attached to the docks or are they just near the docks? So some organisms are attached to the docks and like the seaweeds will be attached to the docks. You'll have, um, animals called hydroids that are attached and tunicates. There, there are animals that are actually attached to the docks. Um, mussels, tube worms, the uh, anemones, they'll all be attached. But there are other animals that live on the, the uh, on the attached organisms. So there are some animals that really just will be hanging out on the seaweeds off of the docks, but not they're not attached to the docks themselves. So it's a it's a mix. Okay. Um it's not a it's not a well, it is kind of a question, but if you have it, your soul sister Susan says she wants to know, have you read the book? The soul of an octopus. She's yes. amazing. Okay. <laughs> oh man, she you're killing her. Um, okay, so one last question. It has really not a whole lot, but early on when you said you were a lens baby um, ambassador, there was a question in the chat that someone said, "Can you talk about the lens baby?" Because they didn't know what that was. Sure. Uh, Len Lens Baby is a small company out of Portland, Oregon, and they make these really funky uh, manual lenses that have creative effects sort of built into the lens. So um, they uh, will create, their lenses can be used to create a more artistic um, effect when you're taking photographs. They can make things very velvety. They can make your bokeh look really swirly um they can lend sort of a painterly effect to your images that happens in camera rather than um, making than doing that rather than doing that in post processing okay jen that is all the questions that were in the chat which were a lot of questions thank you for patiently answering those sure. oh my goodness um your photography was so pretty and thank then it's just interesting but you know when you said um it was the one where you were talking about the plankton and you didn't, you know, you didn't remove it. When I was looking at that, I thought, oh my gosh, the plankton is the sea's version of Boca. <laughs> so, so cool. yeah, it was really, really cool. Um, I don't know about the rest of the people in this room, but I got educated. I got a little education of sea life. <laughs> I'm fascinated by it, but I'm terrified of water. So, um, or terrified of deep water that I can't see through. Um, so this was just really kind of eye-opening. And then to, I have to admit, um, I got on Amazon and I put the TG6 on it. <laughs> Which list? <laughs> it's a cool it's a cool little it's a cool little camera I mean I started I started off using it not even really for when I, mean, I used it for I was using it for marine life but I was taking pictures of mushrooms with it as well tiny mushrooms <laughs> you know using it to really explore the forest in a different way to back in back in the early days well and also you know you can you're getting these photos but not necessarily getting you know like submerged in the water so that opens it up to someone like me that's like well wait a minute because you know those an an anemone and i don't even have to say it anemone anemone yeah <laughs> there's another flower that's very close to it. i can't pronounce that either but they're just you know they're just kind of like you know i i imagine just you know 
swaying in the water and then just to see the colors because that's not something um I've ever seen so I'm I I look forward to finding a tidal pool well you'll have to you'll have to come visit I have okay, to say well, if any if anyone on here finds themselves in the Pacific Northwest definitely get in touch with me I'll take you out to the titles <laughs> awesome all right Jen I have to thank you for coming and doing this presentation and sharing not just pretty pictures, but um, I feel like, you know, we kind of took a tour at the, you know, the aquatic, you know, boardwalk of, of like just messing around in tidal pools. So it was, you, you kind of submerged us into <laughs> thinking and seeing um, things that are so different from our my everyday life. So I enjoyed it and I'm certain that other people did too. Um, Guys, you can connect with Jen through her website, jenstrongenphotography.com. And on Instagram, she's Jen S. Seattle. Next week, wildlife photographer Henrik Nielsen from British Columbia will be here to give us a primer on how to prepare for cold weather adventures in his presentation, Winter Photography, Do's and Don'ts. Until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we see you again soon.